Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, really, there's going to be like a few takeaways from this presentation. I want to emphasize um, from the get-go, and I'll say this several times throughout the presentation, that um, information security is not solely an IT issue. We, we tend to think that um, information security falls within IT, and there's a lot of historical reasons why firewalls first started within IT and so forth. But um, there are other elements of information security that fall outside of the technical controls. So you see sometimes in other organizations, particularly in finance, that the information security function falls more within a different department, not reporting up to the CIO, quite often reporting through the chief risk officer or sometimes the CFO. Um, we're here to talk about information security as risk management because particularly financial institutions have seen that it is actually a risk management issue. So my hope is that we're not really going to talk too much about technical controls. We're not going to talk, go deep into standards and, and uh, that sort of stuff. But what I want you to come away from here is with a, uh, maybe your mind being primed to think about information security more from a risk perspective in your organization and how you can then apply some of the principles and some of the pragmatic information that I'm going to transmit to you during this. So. But before starting, I think it's important to talk about context. And now this worked right now. It works better if you hit the right button. There we go. OK. So I think it's always best when you're talking about um, anything in a presentation that the audience understands the context from which the presentation comes from, the, the uh, background, the point of view, if you will. So just a little bit more about myself. I know Caitlin talked a little bit, but um, I've been in information security for, and, and in, in IT for quite some time. This uh, picture was taken about six months after I started in IT. Uh, my first job in IT was as a network technician part-time while I was a student at the University of Buffalo. And this picture was taken the morning of deploying to what was then called Desert Shield. And if you know, remember Desert Shield, that was, that was almost 30 years ago. So I've been doing this for a long time. The other reason why I have this up here, too, is to talk a little bit about what I did um, in the Air Force and, I was, uh, and how it translates into, eventually, information security to an extent. Um, I was a mechanic on C-130s, so call it crew chief. And I have a love of flying. Uh, I owned a Cessna for the longest time. Kept it up at the Shelbyville Airport in Tennessee, not too far up the road, relatively speaking, from here. Um, and the reason why I bring that up is that uh, there are some elements of flight and pilotage that um, dovetail with information security when you look at both as risk management in and of itself. So um, as Caitlin said, a little bit about my professional career. Um, I was the uh, uh, first chief information security officer for National uh, Metropolitan Davidson County. That's a combined government. Um, for that, I was um, basically the CISO role at Middle Tennessee State University, which is the largest undergraduate university in Tennessee. Uh, it wasn't when I first started back in the 90s, but by the time I left, it was. And uh, the last job I had before um, becoming an independent consultant was uh, with First Bank as the CISO equivalent up there. And again, they're actually about a $4.7 billion bank now loca located up in Nashville. Um, and then about a year ago, I, f I was founding principal of a consulting company where we provide virtual CISO services for small and mid-sized businesses, which has given me the pleasure of working now with all different verticals. So I'm not, my experience is not just limited to say education or finance or what have you. But that's enough about me. Um, the information security again is an awful lot about a lot of things and not just about information, about IT security. So this little word diagram is a nice little way to emphasize some of the other elements. Third party vendor management, business continuity, incident response, policies, procedures, uh, and certainly risk assessment. And that kind of ties everything together. Um, I want us to really separate the notion that information security is the same as IT security. So IT security focuses on the controls within IT, the, the security controls. So you know, your firewall, antivirus, DLP, SIM, UEBA, that sort of stuff. 
whereas information security is more holistic. And if you look at all any of the standards, uh, ISO is personally my favorite, ISO 27001-2. If you look at the controls there, they're not all technical. They deal a lot with uh, governance, which is huge within here. Um, and one other thing I want to emphasize, too, is and it's kind of hard to say this because of the name of the conference, but I'm not really a fan of the word cyber. Um, because, at least from my perspective, again, having done this for a long time, cyber always seemed to me to be more of a marketing term, um, like something that was high tech or something that was really cool. Or it was like, uh, I have the same sort of like angst when I hear like next gen firewall or um, layer three switch, which is just a router and, and, and all of that. So, um, but I understand where cyber fits into the, into the uh, equation, but some people will look at different terms in different ways slightly. So to level the playing field, and so you understand where, what, what I'm meaning when I say certain terms. I, specifically when I say IT security, I'm talking about the technical controls. I'm not gonna probably say cyber all that much. And then when I say information security, it's the technical controls and everything else. So, like a uh, big fan of Stephen Covey, um, his uh, book, The Seven Effective Habits, or The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, um, one of the, one of the uh, habits there is to begin with the end in mind. So, I've been talking a little bit about takeaways, the three things to remember from this presentation, and I know I've said it several times already, and, um, but this is to keep in mind the entire presentation that information security is not an IT issue, but what it is is that it is a business issue. And you see this more reflected in um, organizations as they are um, elevating the CISO level so that they have more exposure to, say, the board level and so on and so forth. Uh, and they're doing that because information security is risk management. So I talked a little bit about flying. Um, does anybody know what that is? Very good, flight computer. An old school flight computer, an E6B. Um, I'm gonna relay a story. It's not based on any particular story, but if you go to the NTSB website and you look up the um, historical uh, reports on aircraft crashes, particularly small light planes, this, this could, I could, this could very well have been a story that was written from, from there. And the story goes something like this. Um, person is going to take their plane that they own and fly to a business meeting, which is only about 60 miles away. It's early afternoon. They drive to the airport. They're running a little bit late as it is. And they look up in the sky. It's kind of like, almost looks like a day like today right now. Pretty much terminally clear. A few little puffy clouds out there in the distance. Nothing nothing really substantial. They uh, get in the plane, they do their pre-flight. Part of the pre-flight is to check the fuel. You check the fuel with a little dipstick, see how much you have in the tanks. You're actually visually checking it as opposed to looking at gauges. Uh, he realizes he could use some fuel. He goes, taxis to the fuel pumps. The fuel pumps are um, not serving fuel right now because the airport's tanks are, are dry. But there's a fuel truck right there that is starting to fill up the tank. So they're gonna be, he's gonna be able to get gas in a few minutes. But he doesn't have a few minutes to spare, so he uses his E6B and he calculates that it's like, well, I need enough fuel in order to make the 60 mile trip. Plus, if I have to divert to another airport, which he doesn't need to have that within virtual flight rules, uh, regulations rather, because um, he's, he's a VFR pilot, he doesn't fly instruments. But he likes to have that little safety margin anyway. That's, that's what a good pilot does. So he goes in the plane, taxis, um, takes off. Um, doesn't, he didn't need a weather briefing because he, uh, again, looked up in the sky. That was his briefing. It's a short flight. But he's probably about 20 miles into the flight where he sees then a large cloud starting to form in front. So you, typical afternoon in the south, you have those little puffy clouds, and they, they build. The convection builds up to where then you start getting those pop-up showers and thunderstorms and so forth. And he sees the one and he's like, well, I already did my fuel calculation, so I'm gonna go around it. That's okay, no problem there. And uh, he gets around it and then he comes and he sees that there's two more, but they're spread out. There's one on this side and one on this side. And he's thinking, well, they're kind of spread out pretty far. Um, does one more calculation on his E6B 
and he realizes that he really doesn't have enough fuel in order to go around again. But the, the two cells that are forming, they're far enough apart, so he's going to go right in the middle of them. And you probably know where I'm going with this. As he's starting to go in the middle with them, as storms typically tend to do in the summertime, they grow pretty fast, they merge together, suddenly finds himself in um, the instrument conditions, the cloud. I think the average uh, time for a VFR pilot in the cloud is something like, I don't know, uh, two minutes tops, and uh, before they end up dying. And that's what happened here. He spirals down, plane breaks apart about 1,000 feet up, and he dies. So the whole point of that story, though, is, is what caused the plane to crash? Well, you could start by saying, um, well, the plane crashed. Well, you could start by saying, why, well, the plane crashed because it hit the ground. But you could start by saying, well, the plane crashed because he lost control because he was in the clouds and he wasn't rated to fly <coughs> in instrument conditions, which would be true. That's the, uh, that's the how the crash really happened, but not the why of what happened beforehand. All the chain of events beforehand, um, the things that he didn't do, the pre-flight briefing, proper fuel, and so on and so forth. And, and just the, the, the aspect of needing to make sure that he had to get somewhere real fast. Uh, they, they call that in flying get home-itis. All those things contributed to this particular accident from happening. And the takeaway from that is, is, with regards to information security, we need to look at sometimes the elements behind the so-called cause of the breach as opposed to the breach in and of itself, the, uh, the whatever is reported. Now, I think that there's an uh, there's a inherent rule or, or we're, we're, whenever you're giving presentations on information security, it's always a good idea or maybe you have to talk about one of the big breaches that happened like the year beforehand. And of course, everybody knows I'm going to talk about Equifax for a moment. It's almost like an obligatory thing that you have to do. So Equifax, um, the CEO, now I'm kind of paraphrasing this a little bit, but if I remember correctly, the CEO testified, maybe it was the former CEO, um, testified in front of Congress that the reason why the Equifax breach happened is because one IT administrator neglected to apply one patch to one web server. And just like the plane crashing, well, that's, that's the... That's the what actually happened. We get that. But, but what was the, the why did it keep, why did that, what happened to get to that point? What were the elements that led to the, the patch not being applied? Uh, was it because the administrator wasn't following po proper procedures? Were there proper procedures? W was there proper oversight? Was there any sort of a follow-up control as far as, um, ensuring that machines were up to the proper level of software patching. Um, was there, did he have the authority or he or she have the authority to do, to do and, and so on and so forth. Was there leadership missing? Well, with Equifax, um, <coughs> you can kind of remove the leadership from the equation as far as personnel goes, because they, they had a security officer in place. And um, of course, security officer is usually the first one to take the spear, so to speak. Um, and that's what happened in the Equifax case, which may or may not be, um, have been the right thing to do. But the point that I'm trying to make is we don't really know succinctly what were the risks involved to lead up to that point. And if anything could have happened to, to arrest that from happening by just addressing one of those risks within the chain. And so that's where information security is starting to think about it as risk management. It's not one control that wasn't applied. It's this whole process going forward prior to when it happened. Now, um, again, from a perspective point of view, um, I always like to talk a little bit about my past so that you understand where I'm coming from. And I mentioned about being the uh, first CISO for Metropolitan National Davidson County. Um, that government is what they call a combined government. It's a metropolitan government is essentially city and county combined together. A little bit of uh, maybe a little bit too much information, uh, but you know you, this might be in trivial pursuit sometime. I believe that Nashville was the first in the United States to do that, probably about 50 years ago. So, Metro Nashville, uh, a little more than 10 years ago. This is in 2007. Before I joined, and I'm stressing before I joined, um, suffered a massive breach, and this had happened months after. Um, Carl Dean was elected mayor, first term. Not the best PR uh, in, that could have happened. So um, 
now, I, I uh, eventually, what, what ended up happening is that Dean convened a, a, a consortium of professional CISO levels within the, the local area that came up with a couple of um, recommendations in order to address going forward for NIP Metro Nashville. One was to build a risk-based information security management program, and then two, to have someone lead it, and that's where I was hired. But that's not the point of the story. The point of the story, outside of the fact that I was hired after the breach, again, remember that. Um, the point of the story is, is the things that led up. So the laptop was stolen, and the way that it was determined that the laptop was stolen is that the, the, the person tried to sell it, presumably for um, just easy cash, where you can imagine what, what they needed it for. Uh, the laptop, though, <laughs> the way he stole it was he broke a glass a window um, that was about ground level. Uh, the laptop was easily within view from the outside. It was um, not, it was laying on a desk. It what, didn't have a cable lock on it or anything, it wasn't chained down. Um, there were no bars on the window. There, there was a glass break, if I remember correctly, a glass break alarm, but it didn't pick up the breaking of the glass. Uh, which is okay, because there was a security guard that was walking around, and that was within, presumably, earshot of the glass breaking, but the security guard did not hear the glass break. There was a camera that covered the area, but wasn't high definition enough, or it certainly wasn't HD at that point in time, or wasn't clear enough to be able to monitor what was going on. So all of these controls failed in, in not necessarily a cascading failure, but they, maybe just if one of them hadn't failed, um, then that breach wouldn't have happened. If there had been like the, some sort of a risk assessment to understand um, why uh, uh, do, we do, do we test our glass break alarm, so to speak, and how confident we are on those controls. But probably the most important thing here, the, the control that failed that, that I haven't mentioned yet, is, is the most riskiest, and that is well, first of all, outside the fact that the data was on the machine unencrypted, but the, the data, there was no business reason for it to be on the machine to begin with. Names, number, names and addresses and social security numbers of 330,000 Davidson County voters. And there was no business reason for that information to be on that laptop to begin with. So here you are, we're talking about risk again. Uh, the government was accepting a huge amount of risk with absolutely zero reward proper risk assessment would have picked that up. So breaches are going to happen. That's not going to stop. But we can mitigate the chance of it happening if we're really smart about understanding how these things occur from, from the get-go. And it could very well be that one root cause of breaches is that it's a failure of perception. And what I mean by that is that sometimes we have the tendency to look at something and not understand the risk of what we're looking at, the threat involved. And, and we ignore the threat, and then bad things happen. This is one of my favorite pictures. I just think it's hilarious. But, um, and when you have that threat of perception, then dangerous things can happen. And so to bring up another famous breach from a few years ago, I'll talk about Target again, because everybody likes to talk about Target. You all remember Target. Um, Basically, HVAC contractor uh, was compromised, and that, that vector, that was the vector into the company for the bad guys to come in. Well, the uh, perception within Target was, well, we, we were fine because we were PCI compliant. I know I'm preaching to the choir here where it's like compliance doesn't equal security. I know that. You know that. We all get that. We're at a security conference. That's like, that's like below security 101. But... Um, not everybody within business gets that. They see the, uh, oh, we passed QSA, or you know, we got a two or a one on our, on our uh, regulatory exam, if we were talking about in the banking world, and we don't have to worry about security. We're going to rate security an A, even though we don't really know because we haven't really assessed the entire program. It might actually rate a C or even below that. So what failed in the case of Target? Well, we already know some of the parts of the chain. Was it uh, poor third-party vendor management, which was one of the um, items on that little word diagram up there beforehand? Uh, did Target actually properly assess the controls of the third-party HVAC vendor, make sure that they had 
uh, at least a security program in place, an awareness program, so on and so forth. They, did they look at that risk? Did they even consider it? Um, what about um, the risk of too much access? So I would imagine that an HVAC contractor probably doesn't need to have the amount of access to the network that will allow them to get to the point of sale machines and the cash, cash registers within Target. But apparently that's, that, was, uh, that was there. Otherwise, the breach wouldn't happen. Um, what about just something simple like, OK, well, the, the, the connection was VPN, which is good. So you tried to intercept that. You're not going to be able to do anything. But, but the authentication was not two-factor. And you know the FBI is so, and, and other government entities, but particularly the FBI, they are so much, they're almost, they're almost evangelists right now as far as promoting two-factor authentication in everything that you do. And I, and I agree with that, so long as it makes good business sense. Again, my point is that, was there any risk assessment? Was there any, was there any, um, any desire to see into those risks? Was, was the governance in place in order to have someone to raise the question as to whether or not that um, we're actually pretty risky here with regards to our third party connections? So we've been treating this as an IT and an InfoSec problem, but really it's not just an IT or an InfoSec problem. There's all these elements of different types of risks and we have to look at it as far as uh, being uh, risk management. So getting back to the FBI, um, just briefly, you all know about the uh, business email compromise. The vector in basically is somewhere you have this email communication uh, between two parties that are about to close a deal. One of those parties gets compromised some way, shape, or form. They don't do anything at first. They just kind of sit and watch the chain of communication going back and forth in order to establish a couple of things. They want to they wanna be able to see what deals are going on, and they want to be able to see how the um, communication is. Everybody kind of has their own sort of a fingerprint, if you will, on their style of communication. Uh, me, for example, I tend to be a little bit happy-go-lucky when I send email messages. I'll start out by saying, hi, Fred, and, and then I'll sign it, thanks, Greg. You know? And some other people are just more businesslike and just write something up there. So the bad guys will get in and see exactly how somebody responds to a message, how they uh, refer to themselves in the signature, and so on and so forth. And then at the right time, they interject themselves into the chain. Right before a transaction's going to happen, they say, hey, don't wire it here, wire it somewhere else. It's done, it's gone. You know? And then at that point in time, uh, by the time, I can't remember the ex exact stats, but by the time that this, uh, um, the person who's supposed to receive the money realizes that something bad has really happened, the money is long gone. It can't be recovered. I think the FBI says that they have to like, be notified within like a couple hours of it happening in order to have a chance of getting anything back. So where in that example really is, again, looking at risks, where, where would there be an IT problem in here? Um, well, I guess you could say that if one of the folks had two-factor authentication in place, or, or the one who was compromised, that would have reduced the risk somewhat. But it, it could have been simply that the, um, could have been a lack of awareness on one part, could have been a, a lack of following proper procedures. Certainly, um, the, the idea of accepting a change in wire instructions via email without doing any sort of callback is really not considered a good, good practice. Again, all these risks. And what this is boiling down to is when we talk about risk management, we have to think about things holistically and not controls just on their own little island. So you can have this laundry list of controls that you think that you have to put in place as maybe an auditor has said to you that you need to do A, B, and C, and D, and, and, and yet you, you understand the environment, well, perhaps I don't need to do C because A, B, and D actually cover the risk. When we're talking about implementing controls, we're not talking about doing that for the sake of checking a box, hey, we got the control in place. We have to remember what the risk is that we're trying to um, take care of. I have an example right now, one of my clients, this is directly from them, where they have this very problem. They brought in a third party, which basically did cyber assessment on them, and uh, I'm sorry, information technology control assessment. And they, uh, <coughs> they said, well, you really need these certain things in place. And the, uh, the CIO, um, told me, she's like, I have no idea, I, I, it's almost like analysis paralysis. I have no idea where to start with this. And so that's when I worked with them on a, on a, on a risk assessment to be able to figure out where that they can start. 
So we talk a lot about risk assessments. Well, what does that really mean? And, and pragmatically in the business world, well, I always like to bring up the three line of defense model. And so, some of you might be familiar with this, some of you may not. I'll just give a brief overview. Um, three line of defense for risk management. The first line typically is like an operational um, entity. So in, when we're talking in information security, a lot of times that's going to be IT. Uh, the second line is the risk management function, and that's where information security should fit. The third line is um, then your audit. So, so how that breaks down is that the first line is responsible for the day-to-day -day risk management activities. So that would be um, ensuring following proper procedures for, um, say, user access management, because that's always a big thing. You want to make sure that you onboard and offboard um, properly and in a timely manner and also that you, you follow the principle of least privilege with regards to granting them access. The second line is more along the lines of um, advising on the controls that you need to have put in place from a risk perspective. So then you don't have IT thinking, well, I need to put in a SIM, and I need to put in UEBA, and I need to put in DLP, and so on and so forth. The second line will help look at the organization as a whole, see where the risks are, the crown jewels, if you will. And that's another saying I really don't care for, but everybody else uses it, so I guess I will too. But, um, and, then, and then figure out where really the highest risks are, because um, you, know, you can't apply all resources across the board. And then the third line, which is audit, which a lot of times, unfortunately, organizations will look at audit and exam, examiners as um, not necessarily on their side, and, and really, um, if you look at it the other way, they, they are. Um, particularly in the banking world, uh, my first exam, well, my second exam, I won't talk about my first exam, that was a little bit interesting, but the second exam that I ever, that I ever went through, um, I, the first exam happened when, when I had been at the bank for like three weeks, so it was, you know, the, that, that was almost very difficult to try to work with an examiner and I had just joined the bank. Well, the second examiner, I, I, I realized, was trying to help us out because they have skin in the game. You know, the FDIC, the little thing about um, your, your, your account is insured up to a quarter of a million, well, they want to make sure that there are proper controls in place. So they're not going to come in and just for the sake of dinging, saying you don't have this control, check the box. They'll look at things holistically, holistically too, from a risk management standpoint. So the other reason why thinking about information security along the three lines here is um, thinking about the separation or the segregation of duties. In particular, well, the third line can't get involved with anything operational. You just get, and, and you usually don't see that. It's usually independent, whether it's internal or external audit and so forth. They don't do anything as far as like put, uh, implementing controls. They can't. They have to have that independence. But you sometimes see a little bit of a blend between the two here. Particularly with information security, <coughs> that can get to be very dangerous. Because what does IT do? IT basically exists in order to keep the lights on, so to speak, and um, you know, make sure that data flows where it's supposed to flow, both to the corporate users and to the customers, um, and also exists to help promote the business by implementing new and innovative technologies to make them more competitive. If you put security in that mix to beyond like a um, basic security, if you will, you start to have the, uh, the impetus, the temptation, if you will, to kind of put security a little bit the side. So you've lost that independence in a way um, because again ultimately IT is going to be judged on how well that they're running systems and how well that people can get things done for the business. So following the three lines here um, should tell us why we need to manage risk. We talked about this a little bit before. We can't keep everything up at, at the highest at all point in time. We, we don't have the resources in order to prioritize every single control. So what a risk assessment does, what managing InfoSec is risk, uh, risk management does, is that it allows you to prioritize as best as possible, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, where those limited resources should go. Is it perfect? No. Um, we have different types of risk assessments. I'm gonna bring one up right here. Um, how, how, how many people are in uh, information security and banking in here? That many, huh? Okay. <laughs> well, if you were, you'd recognize that this comes from the FFIEC's cybersecurity assessment tool, the, the automated um, spreadsheet that, that you can use in order to 
basically risk assess. And all that this is is a representation of inherent risk <coughs> versus where you should be, your maturity model. So it's a little bit of a, of a combination of, of, of a, a, I guess you would, you would say, your risk appetite, so to speak, based on uh, size of financial institution and so on and so forth. Gives you an idea of what to shoot for. But it, like most risk assessments out there, are qualitative risk assessments. And what I mean by that is that they're not purely based on numbers. And the, the, the problem with assessing information security risk is that you really can't assess a, a dollar figure to um, if a breach happens, or even more so if you go down the, the chain. Like, well, how much is it going to save the organization if we put in this $10,000 or this $100,000 DLP system? You, you can't make that determination. You can, you can do that with regards to sales figures and putting in new technologies. Well, this will save the organization X amount of money. Um, so a qualitative risk assessment will basically look at the likelihood of something bad happening, of threat, and then the impact to the organization. And it's, a lot of it is judgmental. It's not perfect. There are other methods out there. There's one called FAIR, and I can't remember what it stands for um, off the top of my head. And I have to admit, I haven't really looked into it too much. But um, you, at the very least, if you do a qualitative risk assessment as opposed to a quantitative one, you definitely need to um, have an understanding at the very least about the magnitude of costs if something bad happens. Um, so I want, that brings me now, we've talked a lot about risk and, and, and how to manage it and not look at it solely as an IT or an InfoSec issue per se. There's four pillars of an effective risk management program for information security, in my opinion. Um, you can disagree on this. You, there, you could put in others, bring, move them back and forth. But from my years of experience, these four particular items are, are if you don't have these in place, you're not going to be effective at all as far as your program goes, as much as you can be. And the first one is the most obvious one, and that is you need to have executive buy-in from the top. None of this works if um, the executives don't treat it as risk management, if uh, information security is risk management. In, in banking, we've got uh, risks are divided into eight categories, and I can't remember what all of them are. You've got operational, liquidity, credit, um, and reputational, I think it's one of them. And InfoSec kind of falls within operational, although I've always been a proponent that InfoSec should be its own risk category there. Um, but if you don't have your business leaders treating information security risk the same as like credit risk or reputational risk, you've lost the battle to begin with. You're never going to be able to build a program on a risk basis. The second one is employee awareness. We've touched on that before. And employees are really your first, first line of defense when it comes to information security protection. The third one kind of dovetails a little bit with that, but goes deeper, and it's trusted relationships. You have to make sure that you establish trust within, <laughs> excuse me, within your organization, both to and from the information security office. I had um, heard from a colleague of mine this one story that um, kind of made me a little bit sad as well, too. But, um, he was saying that he was he, he was a contractor and he was working this one organization to uh, help bolster the security of the organization and and so he comes into a meeting with the IT and the IT direct reports the the director of IT and his direct reports <coughs> and as he comes in the IT director says something along the lines of be quiet now don't say anything the security guy is here and and that immediately you've killed everything right there because th that is the exact opposite of what you need you need to have particularly the folks in IT, have that back and forth, very open, transparent communication. And the last one comes into governance and, comes in, and leadership in particular. And that's when it comes down to uh, your chief information security officer. You definitely need to have somebody leading this program. It doesn't have to be called a CISO, but there has to be somebody, or CISO, depending upon where you're from. Um, but you, you have to have someone in that place that has a risk mi management mindset. It's not solely a technology person. Um, some attributes would be that the person needs to be humble. Um, in our field, I, I think that sometimes we can get a little egotistical in a way sometimes, but we don't want to come across as always like saying no. We can't do that um, because we're not the office of no. Need to really be good with soft skills and, and communication. One of the best things I did for my career is that um, I probably spent about four or five years in Toastmasters. Uh, that's a speaking club. 
Uh, got a couple of uh, certifications, but Toastmasters is really not just about speaking. I learned more about listening in Toastmasters than anything. Uh, and also, hopefully, not to say so and ah so much, but that's another story. But when you look at your CISO, and just drilling down, leadership is, is um, as important as the executive buy-in. I like to try to tell folks that <laughs> there are basically three types of CISOs, in my opinion, three types of security leaders. And this doesn't mean, I'm not referring to the individual themselves and their uh, attributes and so forth. I mean how an organization addresses information security. So your first one, I like to call the advisory CISO. And this person is truly um, second line of defense. They're all second line of defense. Um, I, don't, I guess you could have one that functions within first line so long as you manage it properly. But basically, if you're going to look at information security as risk management, and risk management being a second line, then information security is second line. So uh, the advisory CISO typically doesn't um, have much of a budget, have much of a staff, have much of resources, um, kind of sits down far in the organization. I heard this once at a presentation a long time ago. I can't remember who it was, so I can't give uh, proper credit, but they probably took it from someone else anyway. But re referring to the title CISO, uh, the CISO I use um, to denote the highest level executive in information security in an organization. So you, don't, you, you could be a director of information security, you could be um, information security associate, whatever it is. If it's your responsibility, if it stops there as far as InfoSec goes, and then you report, of course, um, ultimately the C-suite and the board's responsible, but I think you understand what I mean. You're the last uh, line of defense there. Um, but anyway, getting back to uh, that quote, um, CISOs rarely, rarely report directly to the CEO of the board. And you're seeing that more often, particularly in larger organizations where that's happening. But if a small organization is, is, is lucky enough and has the resources to have a full-timer on staff, um, they, don't, they report up a lot of the times through IT, um, sometimes through uh, other, other organizations. But they sit pretty far down. So they are missing the um, authority um, that they need in order to have a higher bit of responsibility. There's three things that need to be in equilibrium here when you're talking about an effective CISO managing an effective risk management program for InfoSec. That is, um, responsibility, accountability, and, and, and authority, they all need to be pretty well in line. You can't give someone a lot of responsibility if they don't have much authority, or a lot of accountability without much authority. The second CISO is the responsible CISO. And as you could, you could probably take from that name, they have more responsibility, and they have a commensurate rise in both authority and accountability. And so because of the rise in authority, they have, uh, <coughs> maybe they report directly to one of the CEO's direct reports. So say to um, the chief risk officer or the CEO or, um, in, again, I'm not a proponent of reporting to the CIO, but there are some cases where if you manage that properly, it works. You just have to be very careful about it. Um, the, the responsible CISO has more of a budget, has more say, um, has more exposure and more influence with regards to departments by virtue of the importance that the organization has put on that role. So they're providing um, now more budget, and more staff, and so forth. But they're still not at the pinnacle, which would be the third CISO. And <clears throat> that, is the, uh, that is the accountable. And that is the, the, the pinnacle, the, the, the absolute top, where, where they're reporting now either directly to the CEO or to the board of directors, sometimes with a dotted line to the CEO. Um, or to audit committee or so forth. You don't really want, I'm sorry, not audit committee, uh, risk management committee would be more appropriate. Again, that second and third line deal. And so now you've got a CISO that has huge responsibility and they've got huge authority. Well, guess what? Then they've got that huge accountability as well too. So they'd better be managing the risks properly or the, the, the CISO, the chief security officer for Equifax was at that level. But you know, when that happened, the accountability part um, kind of came into play, and that's why uh, that person was, was relieved of duties first. Um, I, I mentioned the three CISO model because I've seen this. Um, I've seen where some folks have tried to put it into four different buckets, so on and so forth. And it doesn't really matter how you slice it. Again, I'm just trying to give a pragmatic example of, of 
what an effective information security program, if you're going to base it on risk management, might look like. Um, it's more important to understand your organization, your risks. You just have to be sure that when all is said and done, that you have the buy-in and you have the structure in place. So to conclude, um, again, I'll get back to the uh, first statement about InfoSec being different from IT, but more importantly, how we treat information security is, is as important as how we treat anything else in business. It's important to have information security be a, a, an integral part of the business. The, the CISO has to have some sort of representation in board meetings and, and, and with the C-suite and so forth. Um, now think about where your information resides. And this is how a risk assessment starts. Or, um, if you've had the pleasure of having to go through anything GDPR related, one of the things that you need to do, um, which you really should do anyway in, in an InfoSec assessment program, is, a, is data mapping, where you actually look at the entire life, life cycle of the data from when you ingest it and the points of which where it's touched, accessed, processed, accessible, and so on and so forth until where it exits, how it exits, all the different ways it can exit, and then finally when you dispose of it according to your retention policy. And then you look at each of those points, and then you assess the risks at each of those points. Think about the examples that I mentioned earlier today, the uh, um, Equifax, those different points along the line, the, the Metro example, those different points along the line, in a manner of speaking. That wasn't exactly data mapping with Metro, but the, the methodology is the same. You, know, you, you don't know what, if you don't know about it, you can't protect it. That's another truism that we always hear in InfoSec. And that starts with understanding where your critical data is. And, and sometimes when you go through that exercise, you find like a few surprises. Um, definitely never want to treat InfoSec as compliance or checking the box. That might get you like through an exam or through an audit, but it won't get you out of the papers. And of course, we, we can't reduce all risks. So um, one of the things I did mention about risk management here, obviously, is incident management. Um, you always have to go with the idea that perhaps something bad is going to happen, that there's already problems within your infrastructure. Um, and that's essentially it. <laughs> Excuse me. If you have any questions, my contact information is up here, um, both for myself and my company. Um, but any questions? Yes, sir. Right. Are you of the mindset that we, are you an advocate of that yes. approach, that it should, we should always assume 100% likelihood? Yes, yes. And, and now, now distilling that down a little bit further, when you look at a risk assessment, there's, there's two types of risk you're looking at. There's the inherent and there's the residual. So if you've got something out in the cloud, you have to say that there's 100% likelihood without any controls in place that something bad's going to happen to that. And I mean any controls in place. And so then you put your controls in you, you, or, or your key risk indicators or performance indicators, as a, as a colleague of mine says. And then you evaluate the effectiveness of that. And you come out, you do a little calculation, you come out with the uh, um, residual risk. And that one, you don't want it 100%. That's the manageable right there. But yes, I, I, and I remember, um, was that, was that uh, um, Ross? From NIST. From NIST, yes. I remember him saying that, and I, I made a note of that. It's like, totally agree with that Perfect. from that perspective. Right. What are good models and formulas for assigning an appropriate budget program? Right. So if you if you have a breach, you can certainly the company finds a business reputational damage and they end the company. Right. So what's a good model? Are there good models for trying to calculate resources to address burned down and risk problems? That's a difficult question to answer because that again, yeah, you you can't quantify cost of a breach. So the way I would answer that is, um, it's yeah. Not a, it's not an insurance industry where they have, you know, tables. Right. 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 But, but, but what this starts to boil down to is, again, um, you want your executives to make risk-informed decisions. So that's the whole risk assessment standpoint. 
But um, you also need to understand what your risk tolerance is. So um, you, for whatever reason, you, you could have, uh, and I've had this happen beforehand, doing especially third-party vendor reviews, where um, there was this one instance where they were, they were developing code for this organization, and they were based, the coders were in Belarus. And this is for, for a financial institution. That's usually not a good idea. But there were other controls in place to mitigate that. I still thought that it was a high risk. But the business need um, was satisfied that the risk could be controlled, and they still went ahead and, and, and implemented that. Um, I know that there's formulas to talk about um, infrastructure budget as a, formula, as a function of IT. But I shy away from that for the very reason that I've said probably about 20 times is that InfoSec is not an IT issue. So it, it should be a, a, a percentage of the um, budget for the company in and of itself. But then you've got to look at, from an overall standpoint, um, what the company's um, cash flow is, what its revenue is, what its business model is. And it's, I think that to try to apply a formula to that will never work. Because at that point in time, do you apply a formula to any of the other risks? Not, not typically. I mean, how do you apply a formula towards reputational risk? Well, um, you, you need to manage that. You need to certainly have tools out there to, to scan social media and so on and so forth. Um, the bottom line is that I don't think there is one. And I think that that's um, a, a cop. I, I'm sorry if I'm a little too blunt, but sometimes I'm from New York. But I think that if you have the C-suite asking for something like that, I think it's a cop out. I think that they need to be more involved in understanding, deeply understanding the risk. I think it's just an, it's an interesting question, right? If I, oh, yeah. 50,000 or 5 million, how do you quantify or just qualify, qualify the difference between the, the result and if that makes a difference? Well, you, you could certainly draw like a, a diminishing returns curve, and you know it fits somewhere on there. Everybody gets that the more money you apply to it, the less returns you're going to have. You're going to reach like a certain point up there. And so you can kind of get a good feely-feely for that. And you can do like peer um, comparisons. Any sector ISAC usually has those sorts of surveys out there. And you can usually get that information. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So you were a CISO at a university? Yes, sir. Which of the three models were you when you were the CISO there? And would that be the same that you would recommend for a small to medium-sized university today? Um, I was the CISO equivalent at MTSU, Middle Tennessee State, and um, I was reporting directly to the CIO, so that would have put me within the first line. And I, I was the left muskrat, yes. Um, and I and I wouldn't I wouldn't um, I wouldn't advise that um, because that was from a decade ago, and and the models have have migrated from there. Um, but uh, when you look at a small to medium sized school. You know, sometimes you don't, I'm not going to make this a sales pitch, but sometimes you don't need to have a full-time security officer in place um, because, A, you can't afford it. We kind of priced ourselves out of the business. And, B, um, you really don't, you just need that um, input from time to time. And at that point in time, when you have a consultant coming in, then um, it's very difficult to have that be purely second line because usually then that feeds up through first line. Usually it's an IT initiative. Um, and you certainly, when it comes to the three muskrats, you, the, you, you would never get above advisory at that point in time because you can't offload responsibility. How large is your institution? Uh, 8,000, 8,500. And, and which one is it? Uh, Columbus State University. In Tennessee? Uh, <laughs> Georgia. Oh, okay. But, but as a center of academic excellence, we must have a, a, a CSO. It's mm -hmm. a requirement to be a C, uh, CAE. Uh, and is that requirement full-time or part-time? Or it doesn't matter? Yeah, well, that's, we see that in banking a lot. And it's actually codified in the New York State uh, DFS, Department of Financial Services, 500-something. Um, where, And this just became effective this year, where an organization needs to have a chief information security officer, but it can be um, from outside. But if you do it from outside, the thing to remember is that you can't offload that responsibility. That sits within the organization. Yeah? Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, we're going to take a little break as we change out things here. But um, enjoy the conference, and thank you for coming. <laughs>